So this is gonna be a little bit of a different one. I didn't get to film this one on site, but I did get some pictures of the screens and what I was looking at. And I wanna walk you through exactly what I was seeing and how we came to the determination that I did. You know, this was one that it, it, it can very easily look like a nuisance alarm and it's, it was going to trip you up, you know, and it's, it's not an easy one to catch. But thankfully, uh, this is a YCIV, it's a York air-cooled screw uh, chiller. It's got three circuits on it, three compressors. I was able to go and look at their history reference and, and you'll see here in a second that they have a, uh, a snapshot basically of right when the system trips. It's not exactly perfect, but it's close enough to, to be usable that as soon as the alarm triggers, it automatically tracks and registers all of the data that it was reading in that moment of it actually triggering and shutting down for the safety. So let's roll over to some of those images and I'll explain those. So this is where it started. Uh, the you know, customer called, hey, my chiller's shutting down and it keeps going into a low suction pressure uh, lockout. Uh, which at that at that point, you know, you're talking the low pressure switch, which is not actually on this one. It's not a low pressure switch. It's the transducer was reading too low of a pressure and it was registering, hey, I got to trip out an alarm, yada, yada. So that's what the call was, was we were tripping on low pressure. We needed to check it out. They really needed this system online. This building is very limited on redundancy. And so it's, it's, uh, it's pretty critical to have everything functioning. So what you'll do in this particular type of alarm is you'll have uh, two faults and then the third fault within a set time frame is a lockout. Initially, the first things I want to look for is, okay, are, are, I mean, obviously, are, the, are we dealing with a low charge problem? Did we have a water flow problem? Or did we have a EXV problem? So those are the three immediate common uh, items that come to mind that would tell me what's going on here. Went through and started checking for the um, uh, the leaving waters, right? So I'm checking to see, okay, did we have flow? Does the leaving water stuff make sense? And it does. So as you can see here, the leaving water was 46.3 and our entering was 49. Yeah, just 49 degrees. So that makes sense. We've got enough load on the unit that it, it should not have been tripping. These things run a 42 degree set point. So, and that's what they try to maintain the building at. I don't really care to run them that cold in our area. I much prefer to run them more like 45, but this particular building, they have some data centers that just kind of struggle. It's, it's a long story regardless. We'll keep moving on. So this kind of told me that, okay, I have plenty of load on the system. You know, I don't have to worry about that. If we come back to the status screen, so that button you can actually see in the picture on the top left-hand corner, that is this current screen, you know, if you would see it. Now, what you're looking at now is the snapshot that the history recorded. Now, I only cycled through one, all three, so the two faults and then the actual lockout, which you're looking at the lockout itself but all three uh, of them read the exact almost identical readings every single time so the, what you're looking at here this is the same parameters that it had when the other two instances happened and they happened within a very short time frame of each other i don't exactly remember how tight of a time it was but i mean really really tight time frame as you can see in this though the system one the suction pressure was limiting Circuit two was already down on this unit. They have an IGBT issue going on there. So that unit's already down. It's not functioning. It's not going to come online. Now it's got the anti-cycle timer going, but it's it's that's just a generic thing. It's actually currently turned off in these switches. And then you can also see that compressor three is able to run and it's running without any trouble. Now, again, this kind of feeds into the water flow issue, right? So I can determine that I'm probably doing fine on water because one, uh, I've got a really good load. I've got some good deferential across the barrel and circuit three is uh, loaded up without any trouble and it's not having to limit its operation such as circuit one here though. Circuit one is running on a limited state. So it's, it's, it's not at full capacity because of the suction pressure. Just a, a note of the mental thought process here is you see the 73.7 degrees. That is your outside air temp at this time. So there's clearly not a whole lot of load on the, um, on the overall building, but 49 degrees is still for this particular building 
a good load for us. The compressor itself, again, this is just kind of added data, not as critical, but the compressor itself was only running at 91 hertz. So th this, these motors run at 200 hertz normal. So that's that's less than half of our speed. So we're, we're pretty uh, unloaded on the motor. And that's how these motors control. See, they don't have slide valves like uh, a train screw or some of those others would do. And I've done some recent videos on those. I can try to link that up in the corner so you can go check that out too. But uh, these control load based off of speed. So they ramp the motor up and down via frequency to get the same effect as a slide valve would do on a constant speed motor. See, now we're getting into somewhere where it's actually kind of interesting is uh, we can see that our oil pressure across the filter was really, really low, uh, which was, was fine. I mean, it's lower than it... I don't think it's a live pressure. What I think happened here is, again, these readings are taken simultaneously as the compressor is shutting down. Like it's, so it's not perfect what you're seeing here, but the discharge pressure probably came down. It This circuit usually runs about you know, 10 to 15 PSI across that filter. So that's probably where we were prior to the actual shutdown. Take note of that zero PSI. We'll come back to that. That initially though, so, okay, we'll, we'll pause there. You're thinking, all right, zero PSI. We have some discharge pressure. Now, di discharge pressure is low. This is 134. That is low for discharge pressure. Um, we've got a, uh, we might be running, you know, really low on charge with a zero PSI. Okay. We just keep that thought continuing to move forward you go to the um temperatures so our suction temperature was 42 degrees and our discharge temperature was 89 okay we'll just keep moving forward all right now this is your suction screen so the the bottom left is your superheat reading we were showing 40 degrees of superheat uh the saturation temperature was negative 14 and the uh, the actual suction line temp was 42.5. Again, we pause here, you think about it. All right, so we had a really low saturation temp and a really high superheat. This unit has a superheat set point of 10 degrees. So 40 degrees, it should never get anywhere remotely close to, way, way out there. Seeing that is immediate, just huge red flag. So we're still thinking through the two thought processes. Okay, did the valve fail or do we actually have a low charge? Again, just kind of some more data. The discharge, uh, uh, so this is your discharge readings. We have a discharge superheat coming out of the compressor. That does say negative 6.1. Uh, and the saturation was uh, 95 on the condenser at the time. Discharge line temp was 89.7. That's really strange. You normally these never run any le any less than uh, ten degrees of discharge superheat. And they can run up to thirty degrees. You know, with a standard load, you you put a really heavy load, you might get above thirty, or sometimes you will in our area. But point is, negative six on a discharge superheat. Uh, we'll we'll come back. We'll come back to it. Let's keep going. Okay, motor temps. These these motors usually run over 100 degrees now uh, you're talking 110 120 130 you know normal operating temps under load that does say 41 40 and 39 interesting okay let's keep moving this is a york ycv what this means is that you do have the flash tank operating as an economizer so i've done a video on this as well kind of explaining how the ycv refrigeration circuit and process works this won't be super critical, but you could go check that video out as well. That will kind of help give a little light as to what some of this means. Uh, without that, it's if you're not familiar with this equipment, this would be kind of gibberish at this point. But our flash tank level was at 7%. I'm okay with that. It's not amazing, but I'm okay with it. And our feed valve was at almost 40%. Okay, well, again, it's fine. Now, our suction superheat again was 40%. But our drain valve was 69%. Now that drain valve is controlled by that suction superheat. It's very weird that drain valve is not maxed out at 100%, even though the suction superheat is at 40 degrees with a 10 degree set point. 
again, for this machine, we don't, you do not have that dramatic of fluctuations. I mean, you might have, while it's loading, you might have 10 degrees. Okay. So you might run 18, 20 degrees while you're doing a stage up on the system, but 30 degrees off set point, you just don't see that. As it stands, so like I said, we have two main lines of thought that are immediate uh, things, and I'll address those now. Now that you kind of have the full picture of what we were looking at, let's get into those two lines of thought. So first of all, are we low on charge? It's possible, okay? So we had a really low saturation temp. Now the compressor speed was, was really low, only at 91 hertz. So there wasn't a whole lot of compressor speed. So, I mean, that's interesting. But if you look at our flash tank level, I mean, we have some refrigerant in the flash tank. So at this point, because we, we, we show refrigerant level in the flash tank, the feed valve going into the flash tank is not maxed out trying to keep up. I'm gonna I'm, I'm not gonna jump straight to, okay, we got a low charge issue because of that. If the liquid level in the tank was reading, say, 2%, and the feed valve was maxed out at like 100%, then I would be a lot more concerned about the actual refrigerant charge. But because we these are the readings, I'm not. I'm, we're just going to, so we're going to table the low charge issue for now. Let's focus in on the valve issue. So again, we come back to the suction superheat and the drain valve sc screen. How is it possible with the way that these, the controls in this machine works that you're gonna, going to have 30 degrees off a set point and still only have a 69% valve? Again, it just, this machine doesn't it's not going to let that happen in a real scenario. It's very possible, okay, well, if the valve's not functioning, it's, it's very, very, very possible that this is the case. Here's the thing. Here's the trick and the caveat that my, my, my brain goes to is even if the valve wasn't working, the, uh, the controls in the chiller would still tell you that it told the valve to open 100%, not 69 100 but the valve may not actually be open but it would have thought it was so that kind of makes the whole process stop and go hmm a lot of things don't make sense now here's some things that do make sense 42 degrees of suction line temperature let's go back over to the um the water temps our leaving water temperature is 46 degrees that means that our suction line temperature was colder than our leaving water temperature. Now the suction line temp should be almost the same, usually floats about the same temp as your entering water because that's how high your load is. And so they'll get really close in temperature. Huge red flag right there. So then we come back here to say, okay, suction pressure is zero. Now I'm gonna stop right here on the discharge superheat and say negative six. Okay, what controls what temperature this discharge superheat is going to run at is the suction superheat. The ability for the chiller to control suction superheat is going to change the chiller's ability to control discharge superheat because the only way to get the discharge superheat to go up or down is to increase or decrease the suction superheat with it. Now, granted, if there's problems happening in the compressor, so say you're having a bearing issue, say you're having an oil issue, you're having a motor winding issue, something along those lines, and the superheat's controlling fine, you will still have, you can still see the discharge temperature run high. But the only way, at least that I'm aware of, to make that discharge temperature to run uh, uh, that low, or I mean, heck, to have it run low, period, much less negatives, is to flood that compressor and run the suction superheat way too low. I mean, way too low. The problem we have is that contradicts what our suction screen says because it says we have 40 degrees of suction superheat. According to our discharge superheat, we're currently flooding. Something's not right there. All right, we keep moving on. We have more evidence of, okay, all right, like I said earlier, these motor temps should be running at, um, you know, 120, 130 degrees. I mean, I mean, we had a really low load, so 
and the compressor windings were ramped down really low. So, I, I mean, I'm sorry, not a low load. The motor was running at a low speed, so we don't have as much uh, uh, amps going through it. So, yeah, it, it could have been closer to 100 degrees or so, but it's not going to be 40 degrees. That's just not going to happen. But what it does indicate is, again, we had liquid in the compressor because our motor winding temperatures were the same temperature as our uh, as our suction line temp. Now I'll stop here and say when I walked up to the unit I did reset it and I got it back online and I monitored it and all of its readings were spot on perfect. Spot on. Uh, every Everything looked exactly like it should have. Uh, the, the superheat was, was great. The flash tank level was great. The drain valve, the feed valve were in really good positions. Everything was just as it should have been. So whatever happened, happened in this particular time and moment. At this point, what became very clear to me and the final indicator as to what happened was our dish, our suction pressure showing zero degrees, or I'm sorry, zero PSI is the indicator of what happened. That transducer intermittently failed and it was functioning i even put a, a, a calibrated gauge up against it on the suction line and it was reading exactly on point the problem is is that that transducer was uh intermittently just going out because it's got a little control board and control circuit built into it that it sends a signal back to the the chiller controls and the chiller controls converts that signal over to a relative pressure you know so um, 2.6 volts equals, you know, 100 PSI or whatever. I don't know what the actual uh, readings are, but you get the point. You know, that's that's how it's communicating back. So that control board, something internally happened, and it happened repeatedly. And I think what we're seeing here is, is the unit saw the suction pressure just plummet, and it was trying to run at a um, at a suction limit limiting as it was also trying to get the superheat under control. So I think the reason why we were flooding is it, it tried to, before it actually tripped, it tried to run the circuit for a short period of time, and we're talking very short period of time, uh, with it being in a low pressure state, which is why we went into suction limiting. And if the chiller cannot bring itself out of suction limiting and it continues to fall, uh, for so many, I think it's maybe 30 seconds or something, it will then trip out on that fault. But in the meantime, it was opening the valves and things trying to catch up. And for the sole purpose of it was trying, it saw that it had 40 something degrees of superheat and it didn't want to see that. So it opens the drain valve to dump refrigerant into the evaporator so that we could try to get the evaporator uh, superheat under control. What was actually happening though is we ex we ended up flooding the compressor. Now the compressor survived this, thankfully. Uh, screws really don't like liquid whatsoever. They're, they they do not appreciate it, but it did survive. But that's what caused our negative uh, superheat reading to be so low. I mean, negative six degrees. It just it does not. It's, Honestly, it's not technically possible without flooding the compressor. So evidence to the flooding. More evidence to the flooding is the motor temps. You take these two things, add them together, it's way too contradictory to the uh, the, the, the superheat on the suction side. So that, that ended up being the inevitable issue. That was the diagnosis here, was we needed to replace the suction transducer it had repeatedly failed and inevitably led to this. Now, um, these machines are notorious for having uh, low suction pressure alarms, but there's a couple of things that cause that. Many times what they end up doing is they have uh, some sort of EXV issue. That's probably the most common thing I see is the EXVs get dramatically out of calibration and they, because of that calibration, they, they end up underfeeding the barrel eventually and it causes it to trip on low suction pressure. It's a very, very common issue to have as they get older in age. 
or they do have issues with forming leaks as well, and they do get low on charge. So those are the two most common things. Honestly, I have few issues with their transducers. Now they're like their water temp sensors, stuff like that, fail all the time. But that would not have caused what we saw here. Well, I said, actually, I, I take that back. That could have caused it. That's exactly what happened on the other chiller I did that had a, a water sensor failure. I can link that one up here too. But, you know, that's the, the leaving water sensor got way out of calibration. It was reading several degrees higher than it actually was. And it allowed the chiller to chill the water down cold enough to the point that it... Um, uh, it was tripping on low suction pressure because the water was too low. It was too low of a load, but it thought it was still like, you know, mid forties when it was really down in the mid thirties. Anyway, so those are very common scenarios that we run into and walk up to. And it was not immediately apparent whenever we first walked up to this one, that was the case. And honestly, if it was not for that history log and the snapshot that the chiller takes in that moment, it probably, it, it would have been extremely difficult to, to identify why this chiller tripped. We could have spent a ton of time staring at that screen for hours and hours and that transducer never wants blink an eye. And then sometime that night or whatever later, all of a sudden it becomes a problem and it ends up tripping out. So thankfully, you know, this unit does track that by tracking that history and it's very good about that. And that really came to our aid and made this possible and being able to troubleshoot this from a, from a higher perspective. That being said, I appreciate it guys. Hope you enjoyed this one. You know, let me know if you have what your experiences are, what thoughts you have in the comments or anything like that. But while you're at it, MCT, make the time for your family, for your kids, for your spouse. You, 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 your family really needs you, needs your support, needs your time. Also, YouTube says you're going to enjoy this video here. So I uh, hope you do. Hope you like it. Let me know if you like it. If you don't, then uh, yeah, again, just let me know. Let me know if, if, if this is something you enjoy or not. Have fun.